your Bibles, please open them to the book of Hebrews, chapter 5. Starting again at verse 12, if you join me in standing as we sing, standing as we read, out of reverence for the reading of God's word. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 5, beginning at verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is vain. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Let's pray. Father, I ask simply that you would mature us. Let us be a people who are fit for solid food, who desire solid food and who can physically and spiritually make use of the things that you bring into our lives, that we would grow thereby, that we would be mighty in Christ, and that we would be found pleasing in your sight. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The writer of Hebrews makes the case that maturity, and therefore solid food, belongs to those who have exercised and trained their senses to discern both good and evil. It raises the issue of what's to be gained by this. And there's a philosophy that has become prevalent in our culture that says that we don't ever really need to grow up, that we can remain children forever, feeding off those who are willing to sustain us and living for our own pleasure and entertainment. It's become so prevalent in today's America that when someone is forced to step up and step outside of that paradigm, they call it adulting. And they acknowledge it as a temporary aberrance from the norm, something to be avoided if at all possible. And certainly <coughs> something that should be kept as short as can be when avoidance is not possible. So what about spiritually? Has that washed over into the church? Are we permitted as Christians to have temporary bouts of maturity and call it normal? Or does God call us to something more? Last week we began this conversation in order to allow us to think about maturity with a biblical mindset. And I want to just review some things that we talked about briefly. Why do we seek maturity? First of all, we seek maturity because it's pleasing to God, it's honoring to Christ, and it's helpful to the body. It's good when the body functions as the body. Amen? Amen? We heard testimony this morning about the body functioning as the body, and it is a good thing. It is a precious thing when the body actually works how it is supposed to work, instead of viewing itself as something only to be pleasing to its own desires. With that maturity comes stability. In the midst of storms, in the midst of crises, we have confidence that we are loved of God, we know who we are, we know whose we are. Patience, hope, endurance, and steadfastness grow in the same environment. And with that maturity and stability also comes protection. Protection from Satan, protection from the world, protection from the simple everyday difficulties that we all live from the fact that we dwell in a fallen world. But most importantly, as we grow in grace, we are rooted in grace, and the sweetness of God is manifested in the mundane realities of life. Hope bears fruit in character. Christ is formed in us. And above all of this, according to Romans chapter 3, God is vindicated in his plan of creating a world which fell in order to be redeemed. Amen. This was his plan all along. And he is vindicated right. in that. And it demonstrates truth. So we train our senses to understand. We train our senses to grow because we want to be able to discern good. We want to be able to discern evil. And it's crucial that we can, if we expect to make a difference, to stand in the midst of a fallen culture for truth. Those who are not well-grounded and mature will always find themselves adrift. And they will fall after every false idea. The world chases after bad ideas like a moth to a flame. We also 
can enjoy a confidence that we are safe from the wrath of God. Ultimately, those who swallow the deception of the world will find that they will be judged with the world. But take heart, God does not allow his own children to be finally deceived. So, having covered what we covered, I want to ask the question, how then do we go about training our senses? If all of those good things are to be derived from the practice of training our senses, it stands to reason that we would want to know how. It stands to reason that we would want to understand how to grow, how God calls us to grow, how God expects to equip us to grow. How do we live a life that honors our Savior and King? Well, the very first thing that we need to understand is that to have your senses exercised means that you have to use them. Amen. You've got to pay attention. Right? You can't just drift through life and expect that everything's going to come out okay. You need to have your eyes steadfastly fixed on the God who called you. Steadfastly fixed on the Christ who made you his own. You have to have your eyes and ears open and your mind awake to what's going on. This means that you must engage your senses intentionally, focusing your mind, focusing your heart, Focusing everything that God has put in you to dwell and to think and to ponder those things which are going to be helpful to you. Look at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, starting at verse 8. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 8, Paul writes this. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these things do, and God of peace will be with you. So you got to ask yourself the question, what in the world are you filling up your heads with? Amen? What are you putting in? When, when you have the freedom to choose what you read, the freedom to choose what you watch, the freedom to choose what you listen to, the freedom to choose what you speak about. What are you putting in? What is rolling around in there? What are you thinking about? What are you contemplating? Because if you're just taking in ambivalently the drivel that the world calls entertainment, if you're just taking in ambivalently the garbage that the world calls truth even, Understand that you are filling your head with poison Amen. that is going to keep you immature and ineffective for the sake of the kingdom of God. Okay? I don't have any nice way to put this, and I hope I'm not offending anybody, but let me be very, very clear. You have to be intentional about what you choose to put in. Amen. You have to be purposeful about how you choose to spend yourself. I don't know if any of you are supermen or superwomen or have some sort of special dispensation from God, but try as I might to squeeze out all the time I have, I still only have 24 hours in a day. Right? I I'm only granted 24 of them. I don't have any extras. I try. Now, last night, supposedly, they gave us back an hour, but it was only an hour they stole from us in, like, March. So we don't have any extras. It's, it's all the same time. You have the same amount of time that I do. And if you don't spend the time that you have well, then when you need to call on the resources of what it looks like to grow in grace and become mature, all of a sudden you're going to reach into your pocket and figure out it's empty. I don't have anything. Because what I put into it was of no value to my current crisis. You want to know how the brother stands the things that he stands in the midst of all the trials? You drive by his house at 2 o'clock in the morning and you see the lights on, I'll tell you what he's doing. I'll tell you where he is. He's down in the basement, sitting in front of his little table, reading his Bible and praying. 
or he's sitting up in his living room, sitting at his, his desk at his ancient computer that's over 100 years old, and he's praying. You ask, how does he have a 100-year-old computer? It's called a typewriter. <laughs> that's a whole different conversation. He's, he's doing what's necessary to feed his soul. And I know this as well. When he's praying, he's praying for you. Amen? We don't grow without seeking to grow. You need to, you need to be attentive to this. You need to have your head in the game. You need to understand that your life is not your own. Okay? Your life is not your own because you have been bought with a price. Somebody paid the price for you. And that somebody was Jesus Christ. Amen. And he has an intention for the life that he purchased. And it is not that you learn everything there is to learn about the Kardashians or any other fool that's out there trying to tell you how to live life and what a life is supposed to look like. Amen? Amen? You need to be focused on what God is calling you to do and what God is calling you to become. Because if you've missed it, this is your wake-up call. The days are getting short and the hour is drawing near. Our time in the fire is coming. And if we're not prepared for it, we will fail. Use the time that you have now to prepare for what is coming. Amen? Your attention is required. God is not calling you to sloth. God is not calling you to passively live out your days. I don't care how old you are. I don't care if you're 18 or 80. If you are still on this rock sucking wind, God has you here for a purpose. And he intends that you fulfill it and that you spend the time that you have in a way that brings him glory. Amen. Amen? Your attention is required. So the second thing after your attention is this idea of practice. So this is what Paul, or not Paul, this is what the letter of Hebrews says. Those are mature who have had their senses exercised to discern good and evil. Okay? They've had their senses exercised. Now that word exercised is a funny little word. In the Greek, it's gunazo. And it means to exercise naked. It, it really does. I'm, I'm not making this up. It's a specific reference to the games. Because the Greeks, when they competed in the Olympics and they competed in their competitive sporting events, they always did it naked. And the reason why they did it that way was, I don't know, their own whatever. But... Oh. The writer of Hebrews drew on that, I think, because it's focusing our attention on the idea of shedding encumbrances. It was, this isn't the only word in Greek they could have used. There are other words to talk about exercise and to talk about practicing. and to talk. So there's a reason why he used this specific phrase. There's a reason why he used this specific word. And the idea is that you are to strip away everything that distracts. It's an idea that, that calls to mind focus. It's an idea that calls to mind preparation. It's an idea that calls to mind purpose. It's an idea that calls to mind total commitment, total concentration, total focus on one thing and one thing only. You are called of God to grow up. Amen? If you're not closer to God today than you were yesterday, then yesterday was wasted. And if you put a whole string of them together and you look back over the course of a life and you say, you know what, I've been doing this for a long time and I am no closer now than I was 30 years ago, then you have some serious repenting to do. Now the good news is, is that you're still on this rock sucking wind and so God offers you the opportunity to repent and to turn around and to draw close to him. And it is never too late to repent. Okay? Amen. It's never too late to turn away from sin. It's never too late to stop foolishness and to turn your heart to him and say, Lord, I am so sorry that I have wasted all of this. Please help me redeem it. We serve a God who is in the business of redemption. 
Okay? And that business is good for us because we often need to be bought back. So there are some principles of practice that I want to draw your attention to. And the first one is this. You start with the simple and the obvious, the plain things that are in front of you. And I want to, I want to take a, 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 a side trip that may, you guys may be confused for just a minute, but hopefully we'll be able to draw it back together. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy 5, and we're going to start at verse 3. Paul's talking about the, the lists of the widows that are put on the, the, the role for the church to support. And he says this, honor widows that are really widows. You say, well, that's a fairly simple thing. Somebody's a widow when their husband is gone. This is not what he's talking about. He says, if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents. For this is a good and acceptable thing before God. Now what did he just say? He's talking about how the church is supposed to manage things. But notice what he said. Let them first learn piety at home. Let them first put to work the principles of God's word in such a way that they would live out the simple things that are directly in front of them. This is kind of what James was talking about when he said, you know... Somebody comes up to you and they're naked and they're hungry and you say, oh, God bless you, be at peace, be warm and filled, and you don't do anything to help them. Your religion is a lie. Amen. Right? We have a responsibility to aid those who we have the power to aid. But where do you learn that? You learn that by caring for your own parents. Right? He goes on, and at the end of this passage, he says, somebody, well, let's just look. He says in verse 8, If anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Mm -hmm. Now, contextually, we need to get what he's getting at here. If we're going to take the, the side point that I'm trying to make. What he's getting at here is that if you are not caring for your own parents, if you're not willing to stand in the gap and do what's needful, then you are not somebody who should be running around going, I'm super Christian. Because by your actions, you've denied the faith. We have a responsibility to care for those who God has put into our lives to return the care that was given to us. Right? But the point that I, I want to make here about practice is this should be patently obvious to us. This is right in front of your face. This is right in front of your eyes. These are the people that you live with, the people that live with you, the people that care for you. It should be very simple for us to make the connection that we have a responsibility to return those who care for us. Right? So you practice in the easy things because when you get out a little further, they're not so plain. That make sense? You practice in the things that are simple because when you drag it out a little bit further away from the simplest truths, that's when you start getting into harder territory. You start getting into places where people go, I'm not really sure what to do here. I don't really know how to answer this question. This person asked me this. This person went here. Well, if we have started where it's easy and started where it's plain and started where it's simple, you build up the muscles that allow you to understand what's true and what's not. And that's really what the writer of Hebrews is talking about. Having your senses exercised to discern what is right, to discern what is wrong. Make the decisions when it's easy. Make the decisions when it's simple, when you really don't have any option except to obey. Right? God says, this is what I expect you to do. And he is as plain as plain can be. So do it. Obey. Do what he says. And when you practice that and practice that and practice that, it becomes second nature to do what is plain and do what God says, which means that when you get a little bit further and the water's a little murkier and you're not quite sure what's going on, you've got a good foundation from which to move and to think. You guys have all heard the expression, practice makes perfect. 
Anybody who's done even one cycle with me in choir knows that's a lie. Practice does not make perfect. What makes perfect? Perfect, perfect practice. practice. Thank you. Perfect practice makes perfect. Right? It means that you don't practice until you get it right. You practice until you don't get it wrong. You keep going. And you keep going. And you keep going. And you recognize that the bar is always moving a little bit further ahead. You're never going to get there, which means you never get to stop practicing. There will never be a time in your life, and I know this may disappoint some of you, but there will never be a time in your life where God will look at you and say, okay, you have grown enough, now you can just coast to the end. Okay. If something like that were to come out of the mouth of God, it would be immediately followed by, oh, by the way, this is the end. Yeah. <laughs> You're done. I'm finished, you're finished, time for you to come home. Until that point, you are always called on to grow. Until that point, you are always called on to actively practice what God is teaching you, what God is calling you to do. And as you do that in the simple, plain things, then you will learn to discern the voice of your Father and you will learn how to move forward from that to get the next thing down. This is always something we grow incrementally at. This is always something that God gives us a little bit here and then you work on this and then you get a little bit more and then you work on that and then you get a little bit more. And after a while you recognize, you know what, I've actually learned something. It's not enough. <laughs> I need more. God, teach me more. But I've actually learned something. I've actually grown. There's actually some growth going on. I am maturing. And that's a terrifying thought. On one hand, because you recognize the truth that when you are maturing, it just means there's bigger lessons. But it's also a comforting thought. Because it means that as you are moving forward through this life, you're bringing joy and pleasure to your Father. You are honoring Him. And you are living a life that brings glory to the risen Christ. Isn't that always the aim? Don't we always want to see Christ honored and magnified? Does it change the dynamic in your mind if you ponder the reality that you are either bringing Him honor or you are bringing Him dishonor? One or the other of those things is always occurring. There is no neutrality. Those words that you speak, that attitude that you speak them with, those things that you think, they are honoring to Him or they are dishonoring to Him. There is no middle ground. There is nothing neutral. It should give us pause. It should cause us to take a step back and to rethink some things. Say, okay, well, give my attention, exercise and practice. So how is it then that I understand what it is I'm supposed to practice? I'm glad you asked. Because we exercise what we are taught. And when we start thinking about being taught, we're talking about spiritual nutrition. So at the heart of it, there is a steady diet of the word required. This is, this is the baseline. This is ground zero. Okay? If, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you are not taking in a steady stream of the Word of God, whatever else is going on in your life, I promise you this, you are not growing healthy. Okay? You, if, if, let, me, let me back up from that just a little bit. If you live in this country where the Word is readily available, <laughs> if you are not availing yourself of the word that is available to you in a regular fashion, you are not growing healthy. Okay? That's the bottom line. We need to be taking in the scripture. Romans 15, 4 says, Whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy 31.
Moses commanding the people of Israel with some of his last words to them. And he says this, Gather the people together, men and women, in verse 12, men and women and little ones and the stranger who is within your gates, that they may hear, and that they may learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully observe all the words of this law, that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land which you cross the Jordan. Possess. For Paul's description of the word in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 14, Paul writes this. You must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every So we take in the word for instruction. We take in the word that we might know what it is that God wants us to know. Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs 9, starting at verse 12. Solomon speaking to his son says this. I'm sorry, starting at verse 8. Do not correct a scoffer lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be still wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me your days will be multiplied and years of life will be added to you. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. And if you scoff, you will bear it alone. But there is a, there's a dynamic reality, not only in the necessity to take in the word, but in the necessity to have the right attitude about how we take it in and about how we respond to it when God shows it to us. How many of you like to be corrected? I don't know anybody that likes being corrected. It's usually painful. We're going to talk about that a whole lot more next week, so make sure to come back for that part. But we, we need to recognize the fact that if we don't have an attitude that says, Lord, I really want to hear input from you. I really want to be corrected. I really want to take in the truth. If we don't have that attitude, then we, we really are the negative half of what's being described here in Proverbs 9. We're not a wise man. We are a foolish man. We're a scoffer. And if you're wise, you're wise for yourself. Good things come. But if you scoff, you're going to bear that alone. The consequences are going to be poured out on you. You're the one that's going to pay the price for not learning the easy lessons. Here's the truth. The lessons that God intends to teach you, God will teach you. Amen. Right? He will teach you easy, or he will teach you hard, but he will teach you. Set yourself to be a person who sees the word and takes it in and says, God, please correct me. Change me where I need to be changed. Teach me the truth. Let me be conformed to your image, even when it hurts. There's an arrogance about many of us that just says, you know what, I'm right. And I'm right because I said I'm right. And if you don't think that I'm right, I'm going to prove to you that I'm right. And I'm right and that's all there is. And that may work in your personal relationships, but I promise you it's not going to work with God. You may be able to bully people in, in your life and make them think that's the truth. Or at least make them shut up and, and endure that. But it's not going to work with God. God will teach you what he has set out to teach you. And he is always right. And there's no pretense about it. And if you're going to learn from him, you need to come to the table saying up front, God, I know that I'm wrong. I know that my thinking is wrong. I know that my understanding is wrong. I know that the way I see the world is wrong. I know that what seems right to me is wrong. So please make me right. Correct me. Teach me. Grow me. 
change me. If you come with that attitude, what you're going to find is that more often than not, you will figure out that you weren't completely wrong. You were only a little bit wrong. And God will gently, subtly, effectively change your thinking and cause you to stand more right in how you see the world. But when you come to him with this attitude that says, I have it right, God, and I'm going to show somebody, like Brother James Sayeth gave in his, his testimony this morning, that he was saved by studying the Bible and arguing with a Christian. <laughs> right? How, how'd that work out for you? Really well in the end. But it didn't accomplish your goal, did it? You, you come to the Bible saying, God, I'm right. And in the end, he shows you you're not. When you come to the Bible saying, God, I know I'm wrong, and I want to be made right, in the end you'll find that he corrects you, changes you, teaches you. Now, this process requires something from us. It requires some active consideration. Look at me at Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 10. Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 10. It happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know what's remarkable about that? Jesus didn't really tell them what they were supposed to learn, how they were supposed to learn it. He just told them the truth and said, now y'all go and think about that for a while. Right? And sometimes... God teaches us something, and then he says, I know your brain is full. Go and think about that for a while. Go and chew on that. Work that through the grist. Let that be that which shapes you. Ponder it. See, all too often, we're guilty of hearing truth, reading truth, being exposed to truth, and we think to ourselves, wow, that's really good. And then we leave, and we never think about it again. We, we read something, we go, oh, that's powerful, that's rich. And then we get up from our desk and we go somewhere else and we never think about it again. We're taught a painful lesson and in the moment we say, whoo, I needed that one. And then we turn our attention to something, someplace else and we go our way and we never think about it again. What's required of us to grow is this idea of this continuing perfect practice, which means that you must, as you take in nourishment, as you take in truth, as you take in the Word of God, you must actively consider it. You must engage the brain and ponder what it is that God has taught you. He's saying to us in many cases, okay, I've told you what I'm going to tell you. Now go and think about it. Consider it. Measure it against your life. Measure it against your thinking. Measure it against the things that you're doing and the things that you're believing. Measure it against the ease and the, and the indolence that marks out our lives. Think about these things. You see, when you actively consider something, when you actually engage the brain, you then become positioned so that you must experience what it is that is being pressed on you. It, it becomes a little more pointed. It becomes a little sharper. It becomes a little more painful sometimes. And it becomes a lot more effective. As God begins to press those things to us, think about it. Think about it. Think about it. And you start to live out the consequences of what he's telling you to think about. The, the application then, the opportunity to do what is being shown to you. These lessons always come in this, this triad, this 
here's the truth, here's time to think about it, here's time to apply it, right? If you think about how you've grown over your life and how it is that God has done the most profound things to you spiritually, you'll recognize that pattern. This is what he taught me. This is the time he gave me to think about it and to dwell through it. And then here's where he called me to live it out. And if at any point in that process you circumvent what's, what's being instructed, you go, yeah, I'm not doing that. Guess where you get to go? Back to the beginning, and we're going to do it again. Back to the beginning, and we're going to do it again. Back to the beginning, and we're going to do it again. Because practice does not make perfect, but perfect practice makes perfect. You're going to keep doing it over, not until you get it right, but until you don't get it wrong. You're going to continue to grow, you're going to continue to mature, and you're going to recognize that the things that you think you gained victory over, you've only begun to master. And they're going to come at you from new ways and with new dynamics and with fresh perspectives, but you need to recognize the truth that God is always in the business of shaping His children into the likeness of Christ. You're going to be taught you're going to be given space to reflect, and you're going to be given the command to go and live this out. Go and do it. Put feet to the truth. Let it be something that shapes you. But we also have to recognize the simple truth that apart from Christ, we cannot do this. Amen. Amen. Okay? Because in the midst of this, there is the reality that Christ is the one who empowers us to not only hear the word, and not only think the right thoughts, because according to Paul in, in Corinthians, we have the mind of Christ. But he's also the one who gives us the grace to live it out. Look again at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4, and starting in verse 11. Paul writes this, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever need, in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul says, no matter what it is, I can do it because God is teaching me, but I do it through His strength. For he's the one who strengthens me. We just read, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, which means that there is something underneath all of this that we have to be attentive to. This mystery of grace, this connection that we have to the God who is. Look, here's the dynamic reality. There's a whole lot of people who believe that they are what they are by the power of their own strength and the power of their own will and the power of their own choice. And it's a position of weakness. Because your strength and your will and your choice, according to Scripture, will always lead you away from God. It is only when God Himself draws you, when God Himself calls you, when God Himself does the work that is necessary, that you grow. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Who's the power? Christ. Who gets to determine... What's being done? Christ. Who sets the agenda? Christ. Who gives the timing? Christ. It's all Him. It's all His power. It's all His work. It is none of us. And yet, God calls us to participate with Him in this work of amazing, abiding grace that transforms vessels of, that were fit for wrath into vessels of glory. It's his work. It's his intention. It's his goal. It's his priority. It's his dynamic. It's him. And everything about it takes his truth and shapes it to us. His glory. His purpose. His work. There is an element of divine preparation in all of us. You ever reach a point where you look at something and you go, I understand. Why didn't I understand it 10 years ago? <laughs> yeah. yeah, right? Why, why didn't I get this sooner? Well, on one hand, because you weren't being obedient in the fullness of everything that you were supposed to do. But underneath it, there's another reason. It wasn't time. 
It wasn't at the hour when God had appointed for you to understand it. The situation hadn't been fully prepared. Look at John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Jesus speaking to the disciples about the question of who's his and who's not. He says this in verse 44. No one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Amen. And I will raise him up at the last day. As it is written in the prophets, they shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Two crucial, important things we need to understand. Nobody comes unless God draws them. And every single person that God draws comes. Both sides of that coin. But there's a whole lot of time sometimes that passes between when somebody starts and when somebody finishes. There is a long winding path that is sometimes filled with pain and misery and sorrow and despair. And the psalmist, interestingly enough, reminds us of this truth. Look at Psalm 144. Psalm 144. I'm just going to read the first couple of verses. Blessed be the Lord my rock who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. My loving kindness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and the one who take, in whom I take refuge, who subdues my people under me. Lord, what is man that you take, notice, take knowledge of him, or the son of man that you are lying over him? Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. Now turn to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Starting in verse 65. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your will. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The proud have forged to lie against me, but I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. And their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold. There is a dynamic that works in us sometimes. We think, God, train me for war. I want to be a mighty man of valor. I want to stand up for the truth. I want to fight your fight. But don't make it hurt. I, I want to be a man of consequence, but I don't want to have any pain to get there. See, the psalmist says in Psalm 144, you've trained my hands for battle. But in Psalm 119, tells us how. It's good for me that I've been afflicted. For I've learned to value your word. I've learned what it is to belong to you. This dynamic is always at work in our lives. It is the truth of what it is to follow after Christ. Here's why. In our flesh, we cling with everything that we are to that which we ought not to hold. We grab hold of it. We want it. We are determined to keep it. God is a loving Father. He has no choice but to rip it away from us. He has no choice but to take from our hands that which we ought not to love.
when we're all in here, that process hurts. Amen? Amen. That process is painful and that process leaves the scars. But do not ever mistake the fact that when God is forced to take something from you, what he is doing is giving you something better. Amen. He is handing you something of so rich and surpassing greatness that it's going to take both hands to hold it. It's going to take both arms to cling to it. It's going to take both feet to chase after it with everything that you are. In the end, what God is giving us is Christ. He's giving us glory. He's giving us hope. He's giving us purpose. He's giving us power. He's giving us substance. He's giving us truth. That's his determination. If he is set on giving you something so profoundly good and precious, <laughs> what makes you think for one minute that he'll let you hold on to the lie? If he loves you, he must do whatever is needful to take it away from you. To show you the lie. To show you what it is that you were trusting in that was going to let you down. If he loves you, this is the only option that's available. Christ loved to teach in paradoxes. He loved to speak things that would make somebody step back and say, wait a minute, that, that makes no sense. But if you understand the heart of what he's getting at, it's a little easier to hear. Turn me to Matthew chapter 11. Brother Robbie alluded to this truth during our Bible study time this morning. He quoted Paul. I'm going to quote Christ just because that's the passage I had, but it's the same truth. Matthew chapter 11, starting at verse 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. Mm -hmm. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Say, well, why would he talk about rest and yoke in the same thing? Why would he talk about freedom and bondage in the same breath? Because the truth of this life is that everybody serves somebody. Everybody is a slave to something. And either you are a slave to sin, which is a cruel and terrible taskmaster, or you are a slave to Christ and righteousness, who loves you and wants what's best. The disciples in their writings loved a singular word in their description of themselves. Most of our Bibles render it bondservant. The Greek is doulos, and the literal translation is slave. When they describe their relationship to Christ, they describe themselves as slaves. Slavery is not a bad deal if you have a good master. Amen. Because it's his job to care for you. And it's his job to provide for you. And it's his job to make the decisions. And it's his job to lead. And it's his job to be the one in charge. I don't know about you, but considering all the things that I try to do on my own strength and how much of a mess I make of them, I'm glad that he's the one in charge. Yes. Amen. Amen. You should be too. <laughs> I'm glad that he's the one in charge. I'm glad that he's the one who gets to give the answers to the questions that I don't even know to ask yet. I'm glad that he's the one 
who gets to sort out all the difficulties. But it requires something from me to be at peace with this. I'm not going to change the fact that I'm a slave. I'm not going to change the fact that I belong to him because he bought me. We already established that. He bought me. I'm not my own. But what goes on in here, in, in the gray matter between the ears, if there is any there, what goes on in there shapes how I see these things shapes how I understand them, how I think about them. And if I'm committed to my own self-mastery, and I'm committed to being the king of my own little hill and the king of my own little world and the ruler of my own little dominion, if I'm committed to that, then every place where I come up against the sovereignty and the rule of the king, I'm going to hurt. It's going to scrape, and it's going to prickle, and it's going to make me unhappy. But if I'm committed to his rule, and his authority, and his power, and his sovereignty, every place that I come up against his rule brings me comfort. Because I know without question, yes, the world is as it should be, even in the midst of this chaos. Amen. And I can know without question that everything my God does is right. Even the things that hurt. It's right. There's strength in that. And there's hope in that. And there's purpose in that. So we begin our journey to understand how to grow up by recognizing that our perspective on the world has to change. We have to see the world through the lens of Scripture, through the eyes of the God who wrote it, and lay aside all of our own presuppositions about how things are supposed to be. We have to lay aside everything that the world tells us is right, and everything that our own traditions have taught us. And we need to ask the question of the Scripture, what saith the Lord? What is it that God himself has given us? And we need to let that shape our understanding. Because if we don't get the foundation right, then when we get to the hard stuff, the painful lessons that we're going to talk about next week, you just might run screaming into the night before we even get there. <clears throat> we need to understand that it is God who gets to shape us. And God who gets to define us. Amen. Whether you acknowledge that right now or not doesn't change the fact that it's true. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you give us grace in the midst of this day to understand your truth. We pray, Lord, that you would be willing to shape us according to your word no matter what the cost. That you would transform us into the likeness of Christ regardless of what we think or we intend. God, grow us up that we might be His in every way. We thank You that You're always at work doing this and that You don't need our permission or our cooperation. But Father, we want to be with You in our intention as well. We want to be on board with this because there is peace. Grant us peace. Grant us grace. Grant us mercy, God, and help us to love you as we're called to do. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.